Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose. As long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we've got the Blackhawks uh, with some impressive wins and the Bears with some impressive losses. Loss. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family friendly, affordable prices. You can head on over to icehogs.com and make sure you pick up some tickets to see Finney Hinestroza look ridiculous and just show why he belongs in the NHL, not the AHL. Uh, pick up hat, shirt, jersey, and more and tell him Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex. Hey. What we saw today really sucked. Yeah, um, on a few levels, yes. Um, it, it was one of those things where I tried to put a positive spin on everything, and even though some of the positive spinning does make sense, uh, still kind of pisses me off that uh, there was no win. I mean, it didn't suck like last week sucked, but right, it, it sucked for its own level, own reasons. Right. Um, I, so I, I mean, I guess we're just going to talk about the Bears first. <laughs> might as well. I mean, uh, we're on this topic. We might as well. Yeah, we're we're on we're on this road and and you know barreling down. Might as well just uh, keep going. Um, you know there there was a lot of people prior to the season when the Bears drafted Tariq Cohen that said things like he's too small to play in the league. He's going to be a gadget back only. Um, remember Garrett Wolf, and I just want to point those to those guys. Did you see the opening kickoff today? He used the truck stick on somebody, and he got tackled, but he took somebody out. He he might be little, but he's got some power to him. Well, I think today was a really important day for Tariq Cohen because uh, the last few weeks we we're asking where the heck he was. And then when we finally saw him utilized, there was more offensive production. So I think this should further tell you that he is an important asset to this team. Yeah. I mean, here was my thing about it is the Bears coaching staff, and I, I'm not gonna I'm not even gonna lump I'm not even gonna lump uh um the defensive coordinator Vic Fangio into this. I'm gonna lump John Fox and I'm gonna lump Dow logins into this as most people are they're they're i mean i'll have my own criticisms of of vic fangio but the this criticism falls squarely on the shoulders of Dow logans and john fox is they coach so reactionary it's not they're not coaching uh looking forward they're not coaching ahead of everybody else they're always behind so um, if you are the defensive coordinator for um, the Lions, was named Terrell Austin, you had to know that they were going to give you heavy doses of Tariq Cohen today because after not having him in the lineup, or, well, not, not getting any touches, really, um, reporters were asking a lot of pointed questions about it, and John Fox is like, it's not like we forgot who he was. We we know who the guy is. And so you had to know that they're going, all right, we got to, we got to force the ball to the guy. And and that's exactly what they did. This is, I felt that they just tried too hard to fall for uh, force the ball into Tariq Cohen's hands. And right off the bat is they did a swing pass to him that went 
over his head because it went five foot eight in the air. But it boom. Boom. <laughs> Well, you're, you're talking about the first play of the game, right? Yeah, first play of the game. Yeah, they they just did that swing pass that just went over his head. And I just felt like they were forcing, trying to force the ball into Cohen's hands too much. Yeah, I mean, you obviously saw him do some good things today uh, as a back. Um, and so, you know, to your point, it is pretty reactionary. Um, I think that using him today was good, and I think it led to – a bit more production, like I said earlier, we'll get to that a little bit. What was it, 44 yards, nine carries, and a touchdown. So obviously, you got to use him more because he is a big part of your team. But, you know, you are also right in the sense that there is a lot of reactionary coaching uh, on this team. And I'm not just saying that from just looking at Terry Cohen. I just, in general, uh, there there's a lot of it. Because I felt like when the Bears were leading – they were mixing everything up and they were doing a lot of things that were different and going to Shaheen, going to Cohen, going to Howard, going to him. Like they were spreading things out and opening up the field. And then as soon as uh, the Lions came back and took the lead, then it's like everything changed back to more like what it was. And it, instead of further trying to adjust, they just kind of reacted back to that, oh, kind of scared football. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it wasn't complete garbage like it was with the Packers game last week, right? But there was. It was better. It was better, but it was. It wasn't like consistently better. It right. It was like ebbing and flowing. There was parts of the game where the play calling was just atrocious, and the personnel out there was just awful and incompetent. And then there was other times where. They were mixing and matching, and things were going well. Um, I mean, look at that that uh, drive that scored the game tying touchdown. That was that was a good good mix. That was good play calling. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we've been wanting to see. We saw it in that drive, and we saw it in the first few drives that result in a touchdown and a field goal. I mean, you saw Adam Shaheen being used. You saw Terry Cohen being used. Those are both things we wanted to see. They were used effectively for the most part. You know, you brought up the first throw of the game, which was not very effective, but Cohen still had some touches to gain some yards. Uh, and obviously you spread things around a little bit and you weren't just going run, run, pass, run, run, pass. You were, you were mixing that up as well. But my biggest question of the day for the coaching is this, uh, from the offensive standpoint. Why were your best guys not in on the final drive? A lot of people were talking about that. Do you have an answer for that? Because I don't get it. You just actually touched on the topic I was gonna where I was gonna go. Is yeah. that was that was my biggest criticism is you have an important drive and no Inman, no uh Shaheen, no Cohen, no I don't even think Jordan Howard was out there. Yeah, wasn't was it there Benny, Benny Cunningham? Cunningham? Yeah, it was, why in the world did you take all of your best offensive weapons out in on a limited offense? I mean, this is not like this is the Atlanta Falcons and you can mix and match and there's 8,000 guys that can play on this year. The Bears, you have very, very limited options and you took all of them out. What was it that John Fox said in the post game about? I think it was either, it was either Shaheen or Cohen. He's like, oh, he didn't know the, the calling or whatever. I'm like, what? What do you mean? It, so you're going to put out your B-list team out there? Like, what? He's he's just... John Fox is coaching to not lose his job. And that is... That is the ultimate defeatist going to get your job lost uh, type move. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. It's all I got. Because, I mean, think about it. If you're a contending team with an elite coach, wouldn't you think you'd have your best guys out there in a do or die situation? You would think, right? Uh, yeah. And and here's a quote from Tariq Cohen on why he's not in the two minute package. It's just more so about me learning more things in the offense so that in the hurry up situation, I can be in the slot or I can go to the X receiver or Z receiver, or just be in the backfield. Um, uh, I felt I was used in a lot of ways as a decoy sometimes. Sometimes I was just a guy getting the ball. I feel like 
what needs uh that's what I need to do is to to be a major key in this offense. So I was very happy. I, I, what is anybody talking about in this? Nobody seems to know anything. Why aren't you in the two minute offense? Uh, here's some positive things. Why John Fox? Why don't you have your your best offensive weapon in in the two minute offense? <laughs> Dow Logans. You know, why don't you have your best players in offense? It's like, what? He wasn't in there? Well, uh, what what day is it? I just, it's it's mind-boggling. It's mind how can you How can you be an in, in NFL coaching staff and that's the kind of stuff you pull off? How can, how can that be defended in the National Football League? Yeah. Uh, Adam Hogue confirmed. Um, Jordan Howard, Tariq Cohen, Adam Shaheen, none of them were on the field for the final drive. And Inman wasn't in there for uh, a number of the plays. I just, I just don't understand this. There were times when this offense looked good. Uh, there were other times that they didn't. And, you know, some of it is uh, you gotta, you gotta say, well, you know, we, we have to expect this, some of these growing pains with a rookie quarterback, like the pass, the miss pass to Marcus Wheaton or right. the, the dropped um, exchange from, from the center. Uh, or uh, what was it? Uh, the pass, the the dump pass to Cohen that was like what a loss for five or ten when he should have just threw it away. Uh, yeah, it, 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 there's, but then there's other plays where um, you know he ran for like 15 yards to pick up a first down, or he rolled out and and kept the play alive. Well, that play was see. ridiculous at the end of the game that Chubisky did. Yeah, they. He, you can tell this guy is going to be good. I, I mean, you know, a lot of people are going to rag and be like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. This, he, he sucks, Bob. But you know what is we saw what Nathan Peterman looked like. And that's what you get, you know, nine out of 10 times when you draft a mid round quarterback is your best odds are drafting a high round pick. And Nathan Peterman showed on a much better team than the Bears have, the Bills are much better, is you saw what he did. 66 yards with five <sighs> interceptions. <sighs> yeah, not good. Not good. I I was going to bring something up really quick. Um, I want to get your opinion on uh, kind of what I thought of Trubisky overall today. Um, would you think it's fair to give him – you think a B is a fair assessment for him today? What Like what kind of grade would you give him? Are we putting a rookie curve on this? Or are we just regardless of of experience level grade? Let's say we're putting a bit of a rookie curve on this. Let's say that, okay, he's facing a pretty good team in the Lions. The coaching is what it is. Uh, the weapons he had available were what they were. Given all the circumstances of his status in the NFL uh, and how he performed. Kind of jumbling that all together. How, how would you, well, I'd say a B is fair. Yeah. I would say a B is fair. Uh, I mean, there was some missed passes, um, but there was some good ones there. You saw um, there was a couple, there was specifically one play where I was like, what the hell is he doing? But then they showed that angle that's from behind the play and it, it, it sort of cleared it up where it looked like he ran right into a, the pressure Um late in the game where he ran right into the pressure and got uh, sacked by Cornelius Washington. And mm -hmm. I was like, he just ran into it. But when, when they see it from the other way is Cornelius Washington is not a huge guy and you couldn't see him when, right. you know, when you look the other way, it was, he saw the two bears linemen and he saw a gap and he thought he was going to be able to take off and run. But two guys, you know, were like hidden by the, the mountainous offensive linemen. And I was like, okay, well, now I see what he saw makes sense. I was seeing it right. from an omniscient point of view. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I just remember going, oh, look, Cornelius Washington here to kill his former team because every former Bear ends up killing the Bears. But, yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about there. I thought his two best moments in the game were the play I just talked about where he scrambled for the first down. Uh, on the last drive. And two, it was very early in the game. He found Adam Shaheen 
uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I think it was the first drive. He just threw a, a dime to him downfield, and Shaheen made the catch. So I thought those were two of the most important plays of the game because uh, a he you know threw a good pass to Shaheen, a uh, big guy coming up, uh, you know big important piece for the future, and the fact that he showed uh, his mobility. I mean, he should have been sacked for like a loss, and he was able to rush for that first down. So I thought those were two very, very important plays in this game. And like you said, he missed a few passes. Uh, like I said, the the dump off to Cohen for the loss should have been thrown away. But he had some nice throws downfield. Um, I think that he's clearly getting a bit more comfortable out there. And look, when you're a rookie, you just, you learn. I that This is part of the learning process. And this is why opening up the field for him, using all your assets and trying all sorts of different things is so important because in the NFL, in sports, you don't learn sitting down looking at a textbook. You learn from actually playing the game. Absolutely. He, the reason that they lost this game was had nothing to do with Mitchell Trubisky. Nothing no, he didn't lose him the game at all. No, uh, I mean, there was there were several factors. Uh, the the play calling where it got really conservative, especially uh, when they went down and um, on that first drive when they got in the red zone, the play calling got really conservative, and that's not how they got down there. Um, and several other times in the game where there was just questionable personnel moves and questionable play calling. Um, another John Fox blown opportunity for a good challenge um, when he didn't throw it on that, on that uh, borderline catch. Yeah. Uh, uh, the lions had, that was a, a fairly long pass that, um, you know, if nothing else, it would have stopped the momentum of, of the Lions running up and, and building on that momentum is at bare minimum is stop that, uh, the you know, stop the play of the game and and make them have to sit in uh, for a replay. Uh, what else? Obviously, Connor Barth, and we'll talk about that more in depth in a minute. Um, yeah. And then uh, Marcus Cooper stunk today. Yeah, that's what I wanted to really talk about. It was the the guy hadn't been playing much in the last several weeks, and he finally gets some extended playing time because um, obviously this team throws a lot, and he just looks lost out there. And this is part of the reason why, I, you know, I I'm still gonna ride with Ryan Pace right now, but this is he's one of the reasons why people want Pace gone too, is this was one of his big free agent signing. This and Marcus Wheaton, and both those guys suck. Yeah, I mean Marcus Cooper. The, I mean his his reputation in a bad way all began with the blocked field goal and that whole ordeal, and he was already kind of on our crap list for a while, and then today, uh, I just he got burned several times, but the worst, the absolute worst was on third down and 15. You know exactly what I'm talking When they were pinned back, yep. third down and 15, and Stafford just easily threw for the first down. It, like, it wasn't even like, oh, he extends, he extends, what a throw, what a catch. No, he just he just came out, and he just simply lobbed it, and he was uncontested. Yeah, I, was, that, that began that, the whole downfall. Yeah, that was a play that, that absolutely should have been broken up easily because there was no way that Stafford was going to be able to put anything on that throw, accuracy or uh, zip, the way he was throwing. And if Marcus Cooper would have known where he was supposed to be, he would have easily broken that pass up, and if not, intercepted it. Um, <clears throat> it was it was atrocious. Uh, you know, the turf monster was another one where there was a big uh, completion to, I think it was uh, Ebron, where... Yep. Um, I'm trying to think of who was uh it was a uh, Cravon LeBlanc was covering him, had good coverage and just got caught up by the turf monster Hell, and, yeah. and, and fell down and that that probably would have been broken up. Um there was the ridiculous pass interference on Prince of Mukamara. 
that was that was bad. That was terrible. And can we? Th- those are all factors of why the Bears lost. None of them were on Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, no. None of them were on Trubisky. None of them are really on Jordan Howard or anything. He didn't lose the ball at all or any big fumble like that. I mean, obviously the 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 fumbling of the snap uh, on Trubisky was obviously not good, but that was not the reason they lost. No, it wasn't. And um, and to be fair, is and this is I I don't want this to sound as a dig on Cody Whitehair. Is Cody Whitehair is not a center. He's a guy that they put no, in he's that not. spot. He's a guard or a tackle. Um, and they put him in there, and he's a very, very good offensive lineman, so he's been able to um, make do, but he's not. And he's got he's had a lot of questionable snaps, not just with Trubisky, but last year with pretty much every quarterback that played, all 57 of them, um, he had them with Mike Glennon, and he's had them with Mitch Trubisky. He's he's not a natural center, so he's got issues too. And and that snap wasn't the best of snaps, but it was far from. It was definitely Mitch Trubisky's. It was Hannibal, mishandle. yeah. It was it was, yeah. It was definitely Mitch Trubisky's air, like issue. He he was the one that botched that. But uh, I mean, how often does a a botched snap result in? Uh, you know, that type of play. Usually it's, it just drops dead and uh, the the quarterback falls on it. And this one just got kicked plain and simple and caused yep. a big, big, big problem for the bears. And um, let's also keep in mind that Mitch Trubisky put them in a position to at least tie the game late. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have even been in a position to tie it, which, uh, Gets me into probably one of the biggest points. I think we might as well just talk about the elephants in the room right now, if you know what I mean. Go for it. I don't think there's should be any reason that Connor Bars should be our kicker next week. I think they they gotta they gotta get another kicker. I just I, it's gotten to the point where you just you gotta get someone different. I don't. The problem is I don't really know who's available. Who is it they had in camp recently, or at uh, they, they they had someone trying out. They've had a lot of people trying out. They they've pretty much had at least one person in a week. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of who they had uh, this week. Um, people were talking about it. Um, yeah, I, I just I can't remember who it was. Um. I can't remember. Um, I know I read it, and I just usually is an afterthought because they usually keep Connor Barth for some reason. But right, um, I I tweeted out, and it was a little bit mean spirited um, because of of what we'll talk probably talk about next. But uh, who's more likely to play for the Bears next week, Leonard Floyd or Connor Barth? Oh. Yeah, that that topic that you brought up, I know we'll get to that later, but uh, that's probably the most serious thing of this week. But uh, going back to Connor Barth, um, yeah, I mean, he's just missed too many big ones. And that, I mean, that wasn't like one that the wind just kind of blew off the pole and out. I mean, that wasn't even close. Yeah, the, what I'm trying to think of what was the ex- the the play call, um, the announcers, the play call during the snap was like the snap, the hold. Yeah, that was not good. <laughs> was, holy Moses, Tom! Yeah, I think Tom, Tom Brenneman. <laughs> it was it was so perfect for what that kick was, and it was especially bad after uh, it was a Matt Prater kicked. The, the beautiful kick for the Lions where he he knew the wind pattern and he kicked it to the left and then it hooked back and just went dead center from like, what, 55 yards? Matt Prater is ridiculous. That guy is ridiculous. And you were like, ah. When, they, when he kicked that, I was like, they're going to win because I don't think there's enough time for the Bears to drive down and score a touchdown. 
and Connor Barth is going to just he is just going to fall flat on his face. Well, I mean, even when they lined up to kick, I'm like, oh, God, he's going to miss this. I just know he's going to miss this. And, you know, when I said he's going to miss this, I was just picturing the it's going, it's going, it's going. And at the last second, it just kind of grazes on the other end and doesn't go in. I wasn't expecting it missing by like 50 feet. Yeah, that I I told my wife, she was like, well, what happened? Because she she walked out of the room and I was like, I, honestly, I could have done equally as well. And that is not even an exaggeration. I could miss easily as bad. And it would be true. Because, I mean, it was a good snap. It was a good hold. And nobody got a piece of it. No, it just, he just botched it. Absolutely yeah. just botched it. And I'm and I'm guessing it is he knows he doesn't have a strong leg anymore. And he try he's trying to compensate. And you know, when a when a guy tries to just add more oomph that he doesn't have anymore, right. usually bad results. And and I think that's what we had there. I think he just really tried to put some leg into it that just isn't there. And and I think I think everybody in the world would have been more appreciative if he just kicked it straight down the middle and it didn't go far enough. I think everybody yeah. would have been, I think that would have been at least everyone who said, you know what is the guy, the, the guy just, his leg isn't as strong as it used to be. We know what it is. And the bears go, you know what is we're going to have to get a few extra yards and you know what it is. But when Connor Barth has to kick it far farther than like 40 yards is you have no idea what you're getting. It, right. it, it, you know, you might knock out a, you know, sideline cameraman on accident with it. Well, you know, what's interesting about Barth is from what I remember last year, remember he started off really bad, but I felt like towards the end of the year, he actually was doing okay. And then this year it was kind of a similar thing where he was missing some, and then he started to make him again, especially against Green Bay. I mean, he was the best scorer against Green Bay. And then this week, just completely botching that that field goal. Um, so it, it just goes to show if there's a lack of consistency and you can't rely on someone past the 40-yard line, eh, then it's just it's not going to work for you. Yeah, I, I would be – if – I mean, Monday, tomorrow might be a little soon, but if Connor Barth is a Chicago Bear on Tuesday, I would be really shocked. Yeah, me too. Um, like I said, it's it, it was kind of overdue, but this is just the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, you can't miss that badly in such a big situation, and especially the the inconsistencies had here in Chicago. Now, if this was like one of the best kickers ever and it was just one bad kick, like if, oh, uh, I don't know, Adam Vinatieri had like one bad kick out of like 10 billion, then you just say, well, everyone's due for it. But it's it was missed that badly in this situation after missing a number of big kicks in the past year and a half. So, you know, it, it's it's just, it's time for a change with that. And I know it's hard to just pick up a great kicker, but, you know, if you get someone who's at least serviceable, then, you know, that's what you want. It's hard to pick up Adam Vinatieri or in prime Robbie Gould or Justin Tucker or Matt Prater, but, you know, you, you need to make a change. 24-7 uh, Sports has already researched who the available kickers are to replace Connor Barth. Um, they've got Travis Coons who entered the NFL as an undrafted free agent out of Washington in 2014. And after spending part of the offseason with the Titans, he spent two years with the Cleveland Browns. Um, he spent this offseason with the LA Rams before he was cut. In his only season as primary kicker in 2015, he connected on 28 of 32 field goals, uh, field goal attempts with a long of 47. Um, next, they have... Uh, Andrew Franks, who entered the NFL in 2015 as an undrafted free agent out of Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute. In two seasons with the Dolphins, he connected on 37 of his 55 field goal attempts. And that's not good. Mm, yeah, no. Uh, Young Ho Koo, 
uh, Cole, I don't know how to pronounce it. Won the oh, King was that Young. the guy in the Chargers? Yeah. Um, mm. He was not good with the Chargers from what I remember. Dan Carpenter spent his first five years of the NFL with the Dolphins before a couple of offseason stints with the Cardinals and the Jets in 2013 uh, led him to Buffalo. He spent four years in Buffalo before he was released this offseason. Um, he's made 236 of 281 attempts and a long of 60. These all just sound like guys. Uh, then there's Yeah, Cairo, you're not going to get anything huge. Cairo Santos. Um, He's the most. That was the guy who was recently there. That's who it was. Uh, But there's a concern over a groin injury that initially had him on Kansas City's injured reserve before he was released in September. Ah. So Hmm. yeah, kicker with a groin injury, not awesome. So those those are the those are probably the options, and I guess they could bring back a, um, the the guy that was what the. The, the draft pick of the Buccaneers that they had in for in camp. Um, Kickalicious? Yeah. Wasn't he terrible in preseason, though? He was terrible, but Connor Barth was terrible, too. It was just well, flipping a coin of which guy was less terrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, I think you'd either go uh, with the first guy you mentioned or maybe... Uh, I don't I don't know, maybe you try Kickalicious again, but the guy from the Chargers, whatever his name was, I just he was not good. Um I don't know if a change of scenery would do anything good, but that's kind of a risky thing. But yeah, I, I personally I think the first guy you mentioned might be the best bet. Um Yeah, the the guy from the Chargers prior to this was was a really good kicker. Uh um, I don't know much about him. I just remember him missing a lot of big field goals this year with the Chargers. Oh yeah, he sucked. So. He sucked then. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had a good career at Georgia Southern, but you know, it is what it is. They're going to bring in somebody else because it doesn't. Anybody else could have equaled what happened today. Yeah, yeah, that's you're right. And the Bears are just going to use something as a scapegoat because if they don't, if they don't react after these two back-to-back losses in the division, then the the fans are going to come with pitchforks and torches. Yeah, and I mean these were both winnable games. Um, you know, today was a very winnable game for the Bears. Uh, they didn't get that win. Obviously, we talked all about last week. And to add insult to injury, Brett Hundley got shut out this week. They didn't score a single touchdown, field goal, or safety. It was a big goose egg at Lambeau Field. When's the last time the Packers were shut out at Lambeau Field? It's been a long time, I would imagine. Um, I, and it, I just really would have liked to have won this game because if if we could – because you know that it's gonna, the top two teams in this division are going to be the Vikings and the Lions. It would be nice for the Packers to be the last. It would just feel good. Yeah, I know what you mean. But hey, they, if they would have won these two games, they would they would be. But if the, if the draft were to happen today, the Bears would be picking sixth. Yeah, I mean, this is what I keep trying to look at. I keep trying to say, well. Uh, this has to be the last year we try to play the tank game. Get as good of a draft pick as you can. Um, I, I get that it was a somewhat good tank loss if you want to go down that road. And I know every loss just uh, adds another foot to the grave of John Fox being in Chicago. But yeah, I mean, at the same time, you're so sick of seeing this week in, week out, and every every game at Soldier Field ends in some painfully close loss, and it's just this over and over and over. You get so sick of it, and you just you ask yourself, "Hey, is this truly the last year we're gonna do this?" Because we keep saying year after year, we want to improve, we want to improve, and 
we have a lot of talented pieces, but you know, the wins don't seem to be getting any bigger. I mean, last year they took a step down from the year before, and right now they're three and seven. So, you know, to your point, it just it felt really sucky losing this, even though you could somewhat put a positive spin on it for the future. It it really felt like Bill Murray on Groundhog Day, where you just keep reliving the same game over and over. It's just yeah, different team, but same scenario. And it, and it it's not, it's one thing. It's like, all right, we're not winning many games, but at least couldn't they be division games? What we're winning is three I mean, and thirteen yeah, under three, John Fox in the three, NFC North. Yeah, three and thirteen. Most of our wins are against the AFC in these last in John Fox's era have been against the AFC. Yeah. Which, you know, if you rank if you rank wins, they're the worst wins to have. Like they're the least. I'm sorry, they're not. They're the least valuable wins. Um, the most valuable wins are in division, and we don't get any of those. Yeah, we don't win the division games. Uh, we don't win that. We don't win uh, the conference games, and we win the out of conference games. And and those, yeah, they're just the least valuable as far as standings go. I mean, they're better than losses, but um, you know, we we just stink. We're never prepared, and and we keep coming up with major injuries. Uh, I mean, the the worst part about this loss is um, you saw there was an, another injury with Kyle Long, another in, or there was an injury with Bobby Massey, uh, injury with Kyle Fuller, an injury with um, Keem Hicks, and then the, the most painful one is uh, they had to cart off Leonard Floyd. And and I I, I have a feeling yeah. you know I think every one of us is ready f- to hear. That this is a torn ACL or torn MCL or, um, you know, you just you just pray that it's it's a sprain and not a, a full tear, so that he's not gonna, you know, if it's a tear, he's not gonna be ready for training camp. He's gonna start the season on the pup list. Right. That I mean, that's to, for him to get hurt at this point of the season. Ugh, that I mean, that's really rough. Um, like you said, hopefully it's a sprain, but what John Fox has said, he said it's quote, pretty serious. So I'm expecting a torn ligament. And I think that at the end of the day, this is the worst thing to come out of this loss was Leonard Floyd getting hurt. And to your point, there were a bunch of other injuries as well. I mean, think about Kyle Fuller. If he didn't hurt his hand, he probably intercepts that one ball on the last Lions drive. Uh, You know, the little things like that affect everything. And Kyle Long, I mean, he really had a rough day today, and he's dealing with, what, multiple injuries? Part of me just thinks they might as well just shut him down at this point. I mean, I'm so sick of him not playing recently because of the injuries, but if he's battling multiple injuries, you know, he's still a very valuable member of the team. You know, would they be inclined to just shut him down the rest of the way? Yeah. Who knows? It's... it's it's so frustrating is, you know, when, if you lose, you lose, you walk away, you live to fight another day. But when you start having injuries that affects not only this season, that affects next season as well and the future going forward. Yeah. I mean, especially if it's something like a torn ligament, I mean, People got to realize it wouldn't just be season ending, but like you said, he would miss a lot of next year as well. I mean, it's that's how serious these things are. And the fact that they're happening to important assets going forward, I mean, that just slows everything down even more. Yeah, um, I'm just pulling up. Uh, this is a, um, a website from a... a a surgeon of his common NFL injuries and recovery expectations. <clears throat> ACL injury is one. The ACL is one of four ligaments in the knee connecting the bone to the upper and lower knee. An ACL injury is a tear in the ligament ranging from mild to severe. Uh, physical rehab after ACL may take several months to a year. The length of time you can expect to return to normal activity or sports is different for every person. It can range from, from four to six months. MCL is, usually occurs after impact to the outside of the knee, uh, causing the MCL to stretch or tear. The MC ligament attaches to the femur, thigh bone, and uh, the tibia, the shin bone. 
a minor or grade one MCL tear can take from a few days to a week and a half to heal sufficiently for you to return to normal activities, including sports. A grade two tear can take from two to four weeks to heal. A grade three tear usually keeps out, uh, takes out for four to eight weeks to heal unless associated with damage to the, M- the ACL. So we got to hope for the MCL injury. Yeah, I mean, obviously my hope is a sprain, but uh, I don't think that's going to be the case according to what John Fox said. So yeah, just hope for best case scenario. Yeah, I don't know when we'll we'll hear anything. Um, but I mean, we, I think it's probably safe to assume that we we've we have we've seen the last of him for uh, this season. Yeah, yeah, probably, probably. Even if it is something not quite as serious, I would imagine that it would be enough to sideline him for most of the year, and then just not risk bringing him back at any point. So, yeah, I agree. The big thing now is um, the other the other outside linebackers are going to have to really step up, and uh, if the Bears are going to get any pressure on quarterbacks going forward. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing we didn't see a lot of today. We didn't see a lot of pressure on Matt Stafford, which we've seen on other quarterbacks uh, previously this year. You know, we saw all the pressure in the world on Cam Newton. We saw all the pressure of the world on Joe Flacco in, in other games this year. But against Stafford, you didn't see a lot of pressure, and he was able to have time in the pocket and throw downfield. And when the secondary struggles and you're not getting pressure on him, that's pretty bad. At least the one takeaway, the good takeaway we can have here is, I guess two, is we saw Mitch Trubisky get some some real game experience, and he's looking more and more confident, um, even if he doesn't have the talent around him and he doesn't have good play calling around him. Uh, and the other one is, <coughs> excuse me, is Prince of Mukamara has looked really good this season. Guys yes, he has. People really aren't throwing against him very much um, because when he does, he, he makes plays. Last week, not wasn't as great, but for the most part this season, he's looked really good. And um, it sucks because he's only on a one-year contract. So if you're the Bears, you're, you're probably going to want to look him up, to look to lock him up to an extension before the end of the season because if he hits the free agent market, he's probably going to go to a contender. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's an important piece I think that they're going to want to have around. They did it smart with Akeem Hicks. They signed him, locked him up. I think Bears got to do a similar thing there because I think he really doesn't get talked about a lot. He's quietly had a good season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I guess one more topic I had for the Bears is while I Vic Fangio, I think, did it okay job of, of, you know, uh, dodging punches and trying to counter punch. Um, you know, clearly the Lions got the better of them. And, and partly it was, wasn't play calling. It was personnel, Marcus Cooper <laughs> and, a, and a penalty against, uh, you know, Mukamara and, and some turf monsters and some injuries. Um, but, Ultimately, it was it was Jim Bob Cooter that that won that battle, and it's kind of funny because I think you know a lot of people expect him to be the next Bears head coach. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people saying, uh, you know, the the whole Bryce Harper stuff, uh, the whole future Cub uh, Bryce Harper. It's kind of the same with Jim Bob Cooter, future Bears coach Jim Bob Cooter. I I just think that's funny. Yeah, and. So, I don't know. I mean, you see what he's done with Matt Stafford is Matt Stafford was a guy who had a lot of talent and just threw way too many interceptions and made a lot of bad decisions. And now he makes a lot of good decisions. And I would love that kind of mind with Trubisky. I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, so, you just, you just see the, the offensive – even with a bad offensive line and they can't run the ball um, because of a bad offensive line and they're still able to, to put up points and be a playoff contender. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really it really says something when you can take someone and turn them into something really, really like good. You know, mentally, it's a whole game. And like you said, Stafford, while productive, threw a lot of interceptions, made a lot of bad decisions. And if you could take someone like that who's been in the league for some time, but be able to do that, you know, with someone like that and not a rookie, imagine what he could do with a rookie, you know? Yeah, it would be nice to have an a offensive mind that, uh, you know, could could really help mold uh, Mitch Trubisky. And it would have been nice had they pulled the trigger last year and so they could have tried to hire Kyle Shanahan because I think that would have been the dream scenario. Um, oh, for but, sure. Uh, you know, they got to bring in somebody that, that can help develop Mitch Trubisky because you can't you can't have moved up, which, again, I'm not, I don't have a problem with them moving up to second pick to get Mitch Trubisky. But if you do that, you got to make him the franchise quarterback and you've got to put weapons around him and you've got to build the offense around him. And that includes play callers. Well, yeah, I mean, you go all in on this guy. Like you said, they moved up in the draft. This was clearly their guy. This was clearly the future of the franchise. You got to do everything you can to make sure he develops correctly. That means coaching. That means personnel. That means a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, uh, what's it, what was the... Uh, what was the line from that movie Zombieland with uh, Woody Harrelson? It's time to nut up or shut up. Yes. I think that's, I think that's what you got to do with Trubisky is if he's your guy is you build your coaching staff around him. And you build your personnel around him. And John Fox is not everybody. Everybody in the world knew that John Fox is not the guy to bring along a rookie quarterback. And it, you know, in, in, with impeccable timing, he walks in like, everybody, look at me messing up a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the quarterback is the most important position in all sports, and you got to cater to it. And it goes to show with a number of teams, cough, Packers, cough, that he makes or breaks your team oftentimes. And you got to cater to him. Coaching, personnel play style, the players around him, everything. You got to cater around that asset right there. And yeah, I mean, there was a lot of concern about the way John Fox would handle this. And so far, we're not really liking what we're seeing here. So uh, it just, there needs to be a coaching change as soon as possible. I think in, in my opinion, I, I think we're past the point of the possibility of Fox being fired midseason. I just don't see it happening. I think he's here until Black Monday. I don't know about you, but I just I don't see him getting fired midseason, even if he should be. Yeah, that it, it was a long shot for that to happen. Uh, the McCaskey family, that's not how they operate. It's not a, the way the Bears operate. Um, they don't... They don't do things like that, and and so you really didn't expect Fox to get fired. But if he didn't get fired um, bef before the bye, and if he didn't get fired after the Packers game, he's here. He's here until you're right, Black Monday, and he'll be he'll be one of the first to be let go. Um, and and then we'll all be on pins and needles, like, ooh, who are the Bears gonna get as their head coach? Uh, yeah, because, I mean, for me, what what I said was the whole thing with, uh, what was it, last, yeah, last week against the Packers. I, when, when I said that that was really the tipping point, I mean, that really was the tipping point of the season. I know you said whether it was the bye or last week. I, I really didn't think there would be a coaching change over the bye. I just thought if there would be any change, it would have been after last week's loss because of how bad it was. And that wasn't the case. So, yeah, I think we are stuck with Mr. Fox until Black Monday. Um, now, my one question is, is there going to be any sort of, like, 
pre-firing search, do you think Pace is really looking hard at candidates now, kind of quietly, or do you think that's not really the focus? I don't think it's his focus, but he he clearly has to have people in mind that he's he's interested in talking to, and um, and there's got to be like. Uh, I mean, I think that's part of the job is anticipation of, you know, you you sort of had to know that this was Fox's shut up and prove it year, and he just failed miserably, um, and so you had to have some mind names in mind, um, and I'm sure there's names out there that he would absolutely love to have, and uh, I don't know if you follow. Uh, um, Greg Gabriel used to be the Bears. Mm-hmm. You follow him on Twitter. Mm-hmm. He tweeted out today that a, a very, very successful NFL coach wants to opt out of his contract and left it very vague like that. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to assume that's what's his face in in uh, New Orleans. Uh, oh, Sean, Sean Payton. Payton. I'm going to have to figure that's probably him. It's probably the most logical one. How many other highly successful coaches are are out there? Yeah, and I mean, there have been a lot of talks about Sean Payton, the Bears, for how many years now? He's been kind of the other one saying, oh, future coach, Sean Payton for the Bears. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting, interesting thing to bring up because I don't think I saw that tweet. But, yeah, I, I'm sure Pace has got to be at least brainstorming in his mind some possible ideas because I really, really cannot see Pace. I don't know about Meatball George McCaskey, but Ryan Pace, I highly doubt he wants to keep him on in, in John Fox any further. Uh, yeah, I he's not going to want to keep him. Not at all. Um, and it would make sense. Sean Payton signed a contract, a five-year contract extension in 2015. So he signed through 2020. So that means he would have three more seasons after this to um, to be the head coach. So that would that would make sense, especially considering, you know, who are the other highly successful head coaches? Bill Belichick is not going anywhere. Never. Um, Andy Reid probably and isn't going anywhere. Ooh, I didn't even think about that one. I I doubt he'd want he's going anywhere, but. That would be an interesting one because he's he's an interesting he's a very very good coach but he's not that coach that's going to get you over the hump, right? You so basically have to be an established team. Is, is well, he's he'll get you he'll he'll take you from the bottom and bring you all the way up to the brink, but he will not bring you that prize. He didn't do it with the Eagles. He's not going to do it with the the Chiefs. But he will bring them from a terrible dog turd team to a very very good team that will win a lot of games. That's his MO. And right. I should say, like, he's I, he has the ability to do that, but I felt like the the way he's done that is with a lot of experienced players, it, not like a bunch of kids. At least that's how I remember it. I, I With Kansas City, at least, with, like, Alex Smith and all that. Like, they were experienced players. Well, I mean, he brought uh, Donovan McNabb. You know, I think he they drafted him either the year before he came or the year after. Um, very successful with Donovan McNabb, so he could do it. I just I don't know if that's the guy, and I don't know if that's the guy that they would want to bring in, even if it was. Um, Chargers, Raiders, Broncos, no, no, no. There's no successful coaches there. Um, what's his name from the Steelers? That's a possibility, but Mike I don't. Tomlin? I couldn't. I can't see Tomlin wanting. To that leave. would be shocking. If that were to happen, I mean, right now they look like Super Bowl contenders again. Yeah. Um, unless, unless this is just far out thinking. Uh, he knows that Big Ben is old and he knows that this is kind of coming to the end of the Steelers that he's coached for many years and he's looking for something new. I don't know. It's, it's kind of a far fetched thought, but just kind of throwing it out there. Um, John Harbaugh, I don't know if you consider him a. a- a highly successful coach. I know he won a Super Bowl, but um, that's a possibility. Uh, Bengals and Browns, nope and nope. Um, Mike Jaguars, McCarthy. Titan, uh. <laughs> uh, Jaguars, Titans, Texans, Colts, no, 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 no. Um, Eagles coach is new. 
Uh, Tom Coughlin. Well, he's he's like their GM. It's like he's our president of football operation. He just got there, so yeah, he's I, gonna he's really good. But I don't think he. I think I think he likes the gig he has now. I don't know if he wants to go back to the sidelines. It would be Pete um, Carroll, right? No, no Pete Carroll. I don't think. I I don't know, maybe maybe Pete Carroll. Uh, Rams no, Cardinals no, 49ers no, Vikings no. Me no, Bruce Arians no, no. I wouldn't. Would you call him a highly successful coach? He's a good coach, but he hasn't done. He hasn't won anything. Uh, I, I guess it, it said um, it said like highly successful, as in like. Did he elaborate what highly successful is, or is it kind of broad? It was very. It's Greg Gabriel, so he's. He's vague as vague can be. Yeah, it's true. Um, That's true. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's the exact tweet. Been told a few times now that a certain very successful NFL coach wants out from his current team. And no, Chicago fans, it's not Fox. This coach feels it's time for a change. Oh, the time for a change. That could be kind of important because wouldn't that suggest that he's been in one place for a while? Yeah, so that... That has to narrow it down. Very successful. Time for a change. It's got to be Sean Payton. Um, Sean, yeah. It's got to be Sean Payton or Pete Carroll. Andy Reid. But Andy Reid hasn't been with the... How long has he been with the Chiefs? Three years? Oh, has it, it's a bit longer than that, hasn't been? Um, I, I don't really remember. I I know it's been more than like two uh, let me see. Um, let's see Wikipedia. What does it say? Um, 2013 through present. So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This is his fifth year. Wow. Has it really been five years? So that's wow. either it's e- it's either going to be so that means it's limiting down to Peyton, um, Pete Carroll, uh, Mike Tomlin, or Andy Reid. And you don't put Mike McCarthy in that. Uh... No, he even he even somebody else tweeted something about Mike McCarthy, and he goes, and he basically said. That guy stinks because he can't win without, um, without uh, Aaron Rodgers. Think about it. He's been able to just kind of sit back and be the figurehead while Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre have done everything for him, essentially. Yeah. So that that I don't think he's a very good head coach. He's I don't just, think so either. I just don't know if people would consider just the, the the team's resume successful or not. Yeah. So. I don't know. Those are some really nice names. I don't know if I'd want Andy Reid. Like I said, I think he's a very, very smart football man and a very good head coach. It's he's he's always he's always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And um, so I, I think you could kind of rule him out. Pete Carroll would be an interesting one, but I think he would want to he would want too much power. Um, same with I think any of those guys would want a lot of power if they somehow weaseled their way out of their contract and um and, yeah uh, p carroll is especially one of those guys and i feel like mike tomlin would be the same way yeah p carroll contract curious uh so p carroll signed through 2019 and he's been with the seahawks how long a while now right uh In at least what seven years, maybe. Uh, this is so since 2010. Yeah, so it's been a while. So he's been a while. Um, let's see, longest active NFL coach. Um, Mike Tomlin's got to be. I feel like he's got to be in the top three. Hmm. What is this? 
This has got to be old. Oh yeah, this is from 2012. Why can't I? <laughs> Why is the first one that pops up? Uh... Well, I'll look myself as well because I just I, like. Let's see, Mike Tomlin. Da, 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 da. Let's see, head coach since 2000, the 2007 season. So he's been there for a decade, essentially. Yeah. Um, what? What's Tomlin's contract? Tomlin contract. This is this is uh this is what you do when you have a losing team, folks. Is <laughs> yeah. you start playing these 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 games. Um, uh, let's see. Mike Tomlin signed a contract extension that will keep him with the club through 2020. So all these guys would have to somehow weasel their way out. Right. I mean, it's it's not like they're on the last year of their contract or anything. It's they got some years left remaining and. I think you evaluate the situations of each team. You know, these coaches are teams of good contending teams. Like I said, I look at Mike Tomlin, which is interesting because A, he's been there a decade, and B, the Steelers are good now, but I just I think they're kind of coming towards the end of the road of their contention, considering Big Ben is pretty much almost done. And, you know, a lot of those guys have gotten older the past few years. So you know, I feel like he may think, well, I've been here a while. I could use a change of scenery, and the contending window for this team is probably nearing an end for maybe a little bit. Who knows how long? But I feel like this scheme under Ben Roethlisberger is you know, coming to an end considering how old he is. At Pete Carroll, his team isn't exactly the same defensively like it used to be, and his top two defensive guys are now hurt, even though Russell Wilson is looking better and better. His the Legion of Boom is being kind of shaven down year after year. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of the way I think of it. And Sean Payton, he's been in New Orleans for so long. And, you know, he knows that Drew Brees is 38 and that, you know, maybe he has one last shot at a ring there this year. And next year he may look for something different. So, you know, those are really the only ones that I think fit in all those categories. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see if if somebody really does, uh, you know, force their hand. Um, I I could see the Steelers letting Mike Tomlin go because they're a very they're like a family oriented like they they build a family and I think if you came to him, you know, like a man and said, "Hey, I, I think my my tenure here is, is done. I want to I want to go for a change." Um, I think they would be the most likely to let somebody out of a contract. I think that nut job that owns the Saints, not going to do it. Um, I can't. I can't see any other owner that would even be close to willing to do that. Right. Oh well. Uh, that's the Bears. So next week, uh, I think we play the Eagles next week. Yep. Remember yeah, the last so time we played the Eagles in Philadelphia? Yeah. So then. It really sucks when they play the Eagles because my wife is an Eagles fan. She's from Philadelphia. And I lived in Philadelphia for nine years. So I have a lot of friends that are diehard Eagles fans. And I am going to catch so much shit from them <laughs> come next next week. Unless we pull a miracle out of our ass, yeah. Right, let's not go crazy. Let's not go crazy here. Yeah. Yeah, so next week, next Sunday, Bears-Eagles. Um and then after that, 49ers, 49ers. Yeah, I think we'll just, the, the Bears, if they get any more wins, it'll probably be Browns and 49ers. And I see this team at best finishing with five wins at this point. Here's, here's their remaining schedule um, is next week, Eagles, week after that, 49ers, then the Bengals, um, Lions again. Oh. Browns on Christmas Eve and then the Vikings on New Year's Eve. And honestly, I think they could beat the 49ers, the Bengals and the Browns. But none of those are gimmies is by by you have to expect by the time they play the 49ers that it's going to be uh, 
they're going to have a change of quarterback. And um, the the Browns, although they haven't won yet, they've they've been pretty stout defensively. This is their offense. Stinks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that they have to really. And that's on Christmas Eve, you said? Yeah. The noon game Christmas Eve. <laughs> Holly jolly Christmas Bears yeah. Browns. <laughs> uh, I will say this also. <laughs> I, I, I will say this also about that game against the Vikings. The Vikings may have clinched everything, so they may be resting their starters. So I don't know. Just a thought. It'll be interesting to see who's the quarterback of that game, Case Keenum or Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah. Interesting dilemma they have there. It is. I mean, look what Keenum did today. He's making things work. Yeah. I mean, Teddy Bridgewater is more talented, but he also hasn't played in a year and a half. It's coming off a really serious injury. So, you know, Vikings got a talented team, but... They they beat it. They beat a Rams team that a lot of people thought might have been playing in the NFC title game. So it's, yeah, uh, you can't you can't count that team out. They're a very talented team. They're really well coached, and um, and it's better to have too too many quarterbacks than not enough. Yep, especially when everyone's getting hurt constantly this day and age. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, it's nice, nice insurance policy that you could go to the the guy that you expected to be your long term starter. Abs- right, exactly. Yeah, um, but uh, I guess we move on to Blackhawks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bit more exciting the last two games, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, with the Blackhawks, uh, when we talked last, um, you know, we we were talking. Bad loss to the Flyers, uh, worse loss to the Devils, um, barely win against Carolina, and this week you expected, uh, the based on the way the Blackhawks have been playing, some bad results because they were playing a good Penguins team and a, a Rangers team that had won what six, seven games in a row. Yeah, um, and you saw the Blackhawks. They they gave up some goals against the Rangers, but. They really, they really uh, put some some piggies in the basket in that game. Well, I think one of the biggest differences that we're seeing in the offense now, being more productive, is Artem Anisimov and his ability to have good net front presence. Because you look at all his goals, it's not like he's sniping anything. He's just right out there in front of the net, tipping in passes and deflections. I just, I think that's been missing for most of the season is that good net front presence and. Artem Anisimov is bringing that net front presence that was needed. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you saw that with uh, getting a hat trick in that game, um, which is nice to see. Nice for him, nice for the team. Um, so that that was great. And uh, uh, the biggest thing for me was, have you noticed the decreased playing time for Brent Seabrook? I have. And have you noticed the team's playing better when he's playing less minutes? I have. Uh, hopefully, Quinville recognizes this and keeps that up because I, he's been a liability for this team, honestly. Yeah, he has. And you know what's funny is when he did play in those limited minutes the past few games, he actually looked a bit better. So, you know, if that's what works, stick with it. Yeah, I mean... I- Absolutely is they they've been like because they he's been an anchor to this team uh, defensively. And when when you play him less minutes is uh, it's it's less time that he's on the ice to be an anchor and B is when he is out there, he's he's more fresh. Uh, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, hopefully this keeps up, but. I mean, he was three minutes off of his season low in in minutes in that game, down to like sixteen minutes. And that's it's good. And look, it gives you a chance to mix in more of your other defensemen that you're trying to work in there. I, it's it's good for him and it's good for the team. And I think they need to keep doing that. Yeah, and uh, you know, 
this season, I mean, his puck possession numbers have been abysmal. Uh, you know, his, his Corsi numbers have just been bad. He just, and, um, you know, all of his advanced metrics, they all say that he's, he's not, he's not playing well. And part of it is he's, he's lost speed. Um, I don't think he's, I mean, he's still the same guy that knows how to play in the system and, and knows what he's supposed to do. He's just not fast enough to get to the spots where he's supposed to be. And I mean, that's, that's just the reality of things. Yeah. I mean, when you're getting older and you have a lot of miles on you, like we said in previous episodes, that'll happen. You watch him in his prime. You watch him now. He was definitely more agile a few years ago than he was to now. And again, that's just what happens when you have a lot of miles on you. And the fact that you can now give him, get him a little more rest time to have him a little more fresh when you need it to be. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to have. And when I said that it, gives them a more chance, gives them more of a chance to work out some of their other defensemen. I mean, you got guys like Connor Murphy and Jan Ruda, and you're trying to kind of work them into the system because there have been times when they just don't look like they're fitting in correctly and they're not doing everything uh, the way you want them to. But there are also times when they make some nice plays and you just say, well, you, you got to find the niche that works and you got to keep going with it. And now they have the chance to do that, like I said, with what they're doing. And you could also say, well, if he's fresher now, you can put him in in the big situations because, you know, Seabrook may have lost a step or two and he may not be nearly as good as he once was. But when the game's on the line and close, you want your best guys out there. And, you know, Keith and Seabrook for a career are star defensemen. So it's all it's it's all a good thing, I think. Yeah, and and uh, you know Cody Franson has been playing well. He was a guy that you expected to be um, just a, a veteran presence that if you needed him, um, you know you could put him in. But he's actually been playing really, really well. So uh, that's that that makes it easier to to give a guy like Seabrook less minutes because you've got a guy that's playing better. Speaking of playing well, uh, there's someone who I think is playing well, but the score sheet is not saying it. Uh, do you have any idea who I'm thinking about? And it's not a defenseman, it's a forward. Um, Jonathan Taves? Yes. I mean, I felt like the past few games, he has gotten so many shots and so many opportunities, it's just not finding the back of the net. You know, people are like, oh, you know, look, he sucks now. I'm like, well, if you look at the way he's played, he's played pretty well. He's been really good at the faceoff dot. He's been getting chances. He's been getting his shots off. But they're, they're just not finding the back of the net. I mean, he had a really nice breakaway the other night that was stopped by uh, the goaltender on the Penguins, uh, Murray. And he had a bunch of other shots on goal. And he was, he was making things happen. And I believe he got an assist on the first goal. So... I think Taze has been playing pretty well. It's just the score sheet is not completely reflecting it. That first goal was actually, yeah, it was set up by his big face-off win. Right. Uh, on that, I think it was power play. Um, so, yeah, I would agree with you. Is Jonathan Taves, the, the, you know, the, the vanity numbers haven't been there for him, but he's been playing a lot better. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like he's... You know, he looks a bit more agile like he was, you know, in his in most of his years. It felt like maybe last year a little bit he was, you know, he's getting tossed around a lot. The lines that he were on that he was on wasn't as as strong. So they were just kind of double teaming him and tossing him around. So let's face it, he's not a big guy and he's not one to like, you know, go after you physically. So I think that seeing him have a bit more spring in his step like, you know, he did through many of his other years is a really good sign because a lot of people are asking, you know, where's where's Taze? Where's the, the Taze who once was? I'm like, well, I think we're seeing it now again. He just needs to get a bit more puck luck. And I think if he keeps it up, he, he'll find the back of the net and you'll see those goal scoring numbers go up. I, I think that's right. Um 
you know, Kane, Kane's numbers haven't been great either. Uh, but you know, he's, if, if you could, if you could expand the goal, like a half inch in each direction is Kane would probably be leading the league in scoring. <laughs> um, with so many, so many bar hits that he's got, but Jonathan Tate is the same thing. It's, it's, you know, he's, he's got an all around game. So sometimes it's easy to, to, you know, chalk it up as he's not playing well because you're not seeing it in the goals and the assists. But, um, I mean, he's he's the captain of a team that has been, you know, for whatever problems they have, a perennial Stanley Cup favorite for how many years now? Right. And it's, for me, it's one of those things where I say sometimes players like Jonathan Tays do small, small things that the casual person just doesn't notice. Sometimes it's a face-off. Sometimes it's something physical, which Taze really isn't. But sometimes it could just be something simple, like a pass or a drop pass. And I still think you see a lot of good things from Taze, even if the scoring numbers aren't necessarily there. I would agree with that. Um you know, so it's with Jonathan Taze is, is he, except when you have clearly some concussion issues or injury issues, you get a guy that's going to go out there and be consistent every night. And, and you may not see it in the score sheet, but if coaches that watch him play recognize the value that he brings to a team. Yeah. And there's a reason that a lot of GMs, coaches, and hockey personnel would still say that Jonathan Taze would be one of their first picks if they were rebuilding a franchise. There's a reason for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm just looking up. I don't know why. Uh, I was looking up a history of Jonathan Taves fights in the NHL. Oh, do you remember when he got it with David Backus in 2009 and he just got his ass kicked he's fought back as twice yeah if 2015 that's um, right and, yeah and then it was 2010 yeah the, it, i think uh, it was the 2009 2010 season yeah it was Jan- yeah because it was it was january 2nd 2010 um i remember watching that too yeah. like oh my god taze is fighting yeah his first his first fight was uh against uh Hansel, and then Bacchus, then Thornton, uh, then uh, Henrique, and then Bacchus. Those were his fights. <laughs> I remember the first time he got into a fight with Bacchus. He, he got his ass beat so bad he went into the penalty box and threw up. <laughs> <laughs> One of my all-time favorites was uh, there was a Flyers game, and when it was a... Uh, um, uh, who was the flashy showboaty guy that they had like in the nineties? The um, Flyers? Yeah. Uh was he the the Hall of Famer that was just inducted? Uh, um why wow, can't I remember his name? Um because I think I know who you're talking about. Um, well, Eric Lindros. Yeah, the, yeah, the recent Eric Lindros. He was the recent Hall of Fame inductee. Yeah. So, uh, God, I'm such an old man moment there. Um, Eric Lindros, when he was in his younger days, the game was on TV, and I was watching it, and he got in a fight and just beat the crap out of a rookie from the other team, <laughs> and the announcer. The announcer is there. The cameraman pans to the uh, the rookie as he's going into the penalty box, and he's just gushing blood out of his <laughs> face. And, and the announcer goes, "Good job, Rook." He's like, uh, "You took their best player out of the game for five minutes." But the ba- the flip side is, you can blow your nose from around the corner oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know it, it's funny when you've mentioned Jonathan Tay's fights. I just watched the him versus Adam Henrique fight. <laughs> there was a time it was in 2015 
like I, I remember it like Taze was getting kind of feisty and he was starting to try to fight a little more. We're like, where's this feisty Taze coming from? And then that kind of quickly went away when he realized he could not really fight. No, he's not a good fighter at all. There's a lot of things Jonathan Taves is, and fighter is not one of them. I mean, I, I still think he could kick the crap out of Cindy Crosby, of but uh, but that's about it. There's not too many other players. That he, he I just laugh so hard. Gets his ass kicked by David Backus, goes right to the penalty box and starts barfing from it. <laughs> oh, Johnny Taves, Johnny Taves. Uh, so yeah, that leads us into the, uh, the Penguins game and, um, the Blackhawks ended up winning this one, two, one. Um, and the scary moment was Corey Crawford getting walloped by, um, uh, who was it on the flyers? I mean, on the Penguins that walloped him, was it, uh, Malkin? Yeah, I think it was. It because it wasn't Kessel, it wasn't Crosby, it wasn't Gensel. Um, I think it was Malkin. Yeah, and a lot of uh, Penguins fans were chanting, you know, flopper and whatever. But if you watch the replay, hit him he, square in the head. Yeah, and I don't think it was intentional, but you know, Crawford's had some serious concussion injury issues, and um, you know, so once you have once you have one major one. Not that easy to get another one, and I think I think all of us thought the worst when that happened. Oh yeah, I mean, right when he went down, I'm like, well, I mean, that's that's a probable concussion right there because he was coming in full speed, and even with the mask on, when you take a hit like that at full speed, that still rattles your brain around. Yeah, absolutely, and um, he came back in the game, and and you know was a big catalyst for the Blackhawks and and a big reason for them winning that game. Oh yeah, I mean it, it wasn't it wasn't one of those games that the Hawks got dominated because the Hawks played a really good game. They were moving the puck well and they were getting a lot of chances, but Pittsburgh is so good that they still got a lot of chances and Crawford just shut them down. I mean the one goal that he gave up was just you know a fluky little trickler, but I mean he made some fantastic saves that night in Pittsburgh and you know it coming back from that having a guy rend your head and then making some huge stops in the third period that's impressive yeah and you're starting to see the Blackhawks play a little better on power plays too which is always a good much good needed because both yeah. both were power play goals correct at yeah. least one of them was I think both of them were yeah because what, Forsling scored the first one, and then Anisimov scored the game winner. Yeah, you're right. Those are both power play goals, so seeing that get into gear is also good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you're, um, you know, if you're going to do anything in the this uh, this season and in the postseason, uh, you, you got to have you got to have the power play at least at least be formidable enough to. Um, you know, keep the uh the, the other team honest. Because the Blackhawks were so bad, as I think teams were waiting for a power play so they could try to get a an odd man rush, you know, or a, a you know short right. and a goal. Um, but you know now now you're seeing Blackhawks play better, and and it adds, you know, it adds a, a level of uh, opportunity for them to score which they just didn't have before. It was just like a wasted opportunity. It was just like, oh, this two minutes, they're probably less likely to score than they were in full strength. Yeah, exactly. And even the power plays that they haven't scored in the past few games, they've at least been getting shots and getting chances. Because if you remember back into the Rangers game, uh, Henrik Lundqvist was looking really good the first two periods, really, before that goal scored from Alex Brinkett that just trickled through. But, you know, he was making a lot of good saves and they were putting a lot of pressure on him, both on the power play and at full strength. So, you know, at least even when they're not scoring, it's looking better than it did before. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's all you want to see is see them establish uh puck possession in their, you know, the offensive zone and get some good, some nice shots that aren't just like a, 
you know, easily telegraphed by the goalie. You just want to you want to keep their defense moving, and you want to keep put pressure on their their goalie. That that's what you want to do. Even if they don't result in in goals, at least put the pressure on the other team. Right. You got to put pressure. You got to take shots. You got to move the puck around. You got to move your guys around. You got to have that net front presence. And like I said, Artem Anisimov has been embracing that net front presence and, you know, hopefully kind of more and more to come. So I think the past two games were very important because they needed to get some points. I thought that win in Pittsburgh was very big. And you know, hopefully it's the beginning of stringing something together here because you don't want to draw conclusions because, you know, they could go back to struggling mightily again and we have the same problems. But the two games that we saw against the Rangers and the Penguins, I would say, showed things that we've been wanting to see. Right now, it's just a matter of will they and how will they keep that up. Absolutely. Um, and right now in the season, we're roughly a, a quarter of the way through the season. Um, and the Blackhawks, the st last started today, are, are would be in as a wild card. And the frustrating part is, you know, they, they've strung together a couple wins here, which are nice. But three teams in their division have been the three hottest teams in the last couple weeks. Uh, St. St. Louis is 7-3 and three in their last 10. Uh, Winnipeg is 8-1-1 and one in their last 10. And Nashville is 7-3 in their last 10. So it's like the Blackhawks can't even gain any ground on any of those teams, which is the frustrating part. Here's how I look at it. It's very frustrating, no doubt, but eventually those teams are going to cool off and that's going to be the opportunity for the Hawks to kind of try to get back into it. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be in a few weeks, in a week, maybe a month, but eventually those teams are going to cool down and the Hawks are going to have to string some wins together to keep pace with it because you know, they didn't dig a massive hole, but they did dig themselves into something where they are behind those teams and I think they realize that they, they can't continue to play up, down, up, down, up, down. There's a number of talented teams in the division. So, you know, they just string some, string some wins together, play some good hockey, and, you know, eventually some of those teams are going to have low patches. So now's a good time to start getting hot again because it's going to happen to one of them. So that's kind of how I try to look at it. Um, it's interesting. We're here Thanksgiving week. And there's no road trip. The no famous circus road trip anymore. Absolutely. Um, and I think with this win over the Penguins, is this three or four years in a row the Blackhawks uh, have swept the season series against the Penguins? Yeah, I think they've won like eight straight. Yeah. Um, and just briefly, I was I was trying to pull that stat, and I just saw an, uh, a... Uh, a headline in a newspaper that um, the city council asked f citizens to name its two new road gridders and the public's top two voting uh, names, David Plowy and Gritsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Anti-Slip Machiney. What? <laughs> uh, sometimes the public is amazing. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Um, so yeah, right right now the Blackhawks uh, have strung together some nice wins there, um, and they get a nice little break. Uh, they get they have to, uh, today, tomorrow, and and Tuesday off before they have to go to Tampa Bay and play the Lightning, um, and then they don't play again until Saturday after that, where they're playing against Florida. So they'll probably have some leisure time in Florida with Thursday and Friday off. It's been Thanksgiving in, in sunny Florida. Yeah, we don't have that uh, 2 o'clock Ducks game post-Thanksgiving to look forward to. We have the night before Thanksgiving game to look forward to, but for the first time in forever, it's not against the Sharks because it just seemed like every year around Thanksgiving, I'd have the same traditional games. It was always the Sharks right before Thanksgiving, the Ducks the day after Thanksgiving, and then the LA Kings right after that. It's not that anymore. I, honestly, as a fan, it was the the circus trip was a little bit nerve wracking because you could really, you know, cost yourself in the standings for that that two weeks. But on the other hand, it was it was kind of nice because, um, you know, 
right around the holidays when, you know, things are stressful and you got a lot of stuff to do, you finally get a, several things done in a day and, and you could sit down and watch a late night game um, where you don't have to get up in the morning and and see the the Hawks play some West Coast team. So in some ways it was kind of nice and, and I'm going to miss those circus trips a little bit. Yeah, like I said, I, I always enjoyed lazing around the day after Thanksgiving and, you know, get up late and then, oh, nice uh, early afternoon hockey against the Ducks at the Honda Center. Always just kind of go downstairs and watch that as I would have a turkey stuffing hangover the next day. So I will I will miss that a little bit, I must admit. And uh, Black Wednesday was always fun because you, you'd go out to the bar with a friend and you'd watch the game there, uh, which you can still do this year. It'll just be weird seeing it not against the Sharks because I'm always used to it being against the Sharks. Yeah, this, this year it'll be against the Lightning. Uh, right. But the week after Thanksgiving, that's when the schedule starts getting a little rougher, not necessarily by teams, but just number of games. More it's compact. Like yeah, so uh, the following week, the – the Blackhawks have a Monday at home, Tuesday in Nashville, and then a Thursday back home um, against Dallas. So uh, that's that's when you start, you know, feeling it. And the the, the veteran players, uh, you know, they don't get that three days of rest between games. Right, exactly. And, you know, it, it speaks a lot when – you have like one week and there's like one game, then like four games in a week. And you know, you can obviously tell when players get exhausted and not. And sometimes it's like, well, you want to watch hockey every night, but at the same time, you understand that it's good to have games kind of spaced out like that sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a bummer that there's no Christmas Eve game though. Uh, they play. We have the bears and Browns though. <laughs> I want to watch a good game. But the night, the night before Christmas Eve, we have the Blackhawks and Devils. So hopefully they can uh, avenge that that seven to five loss from from last week. Uh, yeah, we'll see. It seems like the Hawks don't really play well on the road in those uh, Eastern Conference buildings, aside from like Pittsburgh and the Bell Center. They always seem to struggle in those those East Coast buildings. But hopefully they'll play a good game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't really have anything else to say. I mean, the Bulls won a game, whoop de doo uh, but then they've started Jerry, uh, Jaron Grant again, um, and he's terrible. So it's proof that the Bulls are just tanking. Yeah. I mean, Hey, good for the people at the game. They got big Macs. Might be the only time they get big Macs. Uh, and Paul, so for them. remember when we thought last year that he was going to be decent? Yeah, I do. This year he stinks on ice. Yeah, yeah, it's n not not great, Bob. <laughs> um, and one last thing is baseball. There's really nothing going on yet because the winter meetings haven't started. So this is like the dullest point of the year for baseball. But I, I've read two articles um, about uh. Um, what's his name that the Dodgers traded for? In the, you Darvish, you Darvish. Uh, one was the the Cubs will absolutely positively not sign you Darvish. The other one is all signs are pointing to the Cubs signing you Darvish. They're not going to sign you Darvish. I'm just going to say that right now. They're not going to sign you Darvish. I would be shocked if they signed you Darvish. Um, I mean, honestly, is. They they have to realize that, um, you know, they're going to have to give an extension sooner rather than later to Chris Bryant. Uh, they're going to have to give an extension sooner rather than later to Anthony Rizzo. Um, all the the other young players are going to start being arbitration eligible, um, and you're paying massive money f to John Lester. So I, I have a feeling that they're going to go into the season with. Um, Quintana, Lester, and Hendricks as their one, two, and three. So if they're bringing in pitchers as free agents, they're going to be number fours and number fives. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, Alex Cobb, I, I like the chances of Alex Cobb coming here. I think uh, I think it's a matter of time before we hear that. That's one thing I'm pretty confident in is I think Alex Cobb will 
be the next four starter on the team. He'll be reunited with Jim Hickey, Joe Madden. They've talked already. He's expressed interest. Uh, I just think it's kind of a working out of the details. So, you know, I I think that's going to be one of their big signings. And then they're going to go out and get another fifth starter, maybe a Jalice Chassin or something like that. There's also the rumors about Lance Lynn, but I'm not so sure they're going to get, if they get Alex Cobb, I don't know if they're going to go after Lance Lynn as well. It's probably going to be one or the other. Yeah. I can't see them signing both. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but it would be shocking. Um, right. And, uh, I'm, I'm just curious to see because John Lackey has expressed interest in playing next year is where he goes. Yeah, and as much as I appreciate what John Lackey did in the 2016 regular season and in the second half last year, uh, I think they got to move on from John Lackey. He's going to be 40 years old. He's clearly on the decline. Um, If they were to just keep him aboard as the official uh, red-ass intimidator and not actually play, then I wouldn't be so opposed to that if just – there's a call that Joe disagrees with and he just opens up a cage and John Lackey goes out guns a blazing with a bottle of whiskey. I, I wouldn't mind that at all, but uh, I don't think that's well, going to happen. Got, he's got a long memory. Hey, well, exactly. He can serve as a guy with a long memory and you know, uh, he'll, he'll make the umpires know that as the umpires say, wait, where the hell did John Lackey come from? <laughs> John, John Lackey. It's like pro wrestling. He comes running down to the ring and, and dropping elbows. <laughs> Smashing everyone with a chair. He doesn't. He doesn't know what's going on. He just. He knows when Joe Madden just opens the cage. He just knows to go out there and just just raise hell out there. Though the thing is, they don't even put him in the the bullpen or in the the, the dugout. They have him just seated randomly in a seat, so you know know where he's coming from. But they play his his, his intro music, and you just see him running down the aisle of, <laughs> from the stands and jump the fence and charge somebody <laughs> he, he just leaps over the brick wall you see his long legs just stride and leap into the air like a tiger just <laughs> and he's got he's got a cubs uniform on but he has his cowboy hat on and not like a baseball cap <laughs> he, he's sitting in the bleachers with ronnie woo woo <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then when he hear he hears his music, he knows it's time to get the hell out there. So he springboards off the the basket on the on the wall and just goes out there. He's like, "Who am I fighting? <laughs> fighting everybody? I got a long memory. <laughs> Let's get it on. Oh, you want to mess with me? Oh, I got a long memory, boy. It just starts." swinging I didn't, I didn't come here to i didn't come here to sit in the stands and eat a hot dog i came here to get it on <laughs> i got my jewelry i'm gonna use it to kick your ass i ain't here sitting in the stands getting a haircut <laughs> believe me woo woo don't get no haircuts and neither do i oh my god john lackey <laughs> what a guy Oh, uh, he is <laughs> just the Captain Red Ass. I would love to put him in a room uh, with Hawk Harrelson and just and just play things that aggravate them and see who would get the more red assed. <laughs> you lock the door and you observe from like one of those like surgeon balconies. Uh, yeah, you just you know you tell Lackey that the ump was right, and you know you tell Hawk that. Yaz wasn't that good. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Just watch the two of them. <laughs> and the thing is, it's like you know, obviously Hawk is much older than John Lackey, but they're both you know old for their respective age. So they just <laughs> they blabber on and try to go at each other, but they'd be real slow, just trying to claw at each other. Hey, John, Hawk said you were intentionally thrown at Sox players. Hawk, John was saying that Yaz is terrible and that he would strike him out. Oh, no, 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 no. No one says that about Yaz. That, that's, the thing about, that's the thing about John Lackey is he doesn't have the TWTW. He don't have no TWTW or respect. 
What's that old guy talk about anyway? I got a long memory, and I know that he doesn't respect me, so I'm going to kick his ass. I got a long memory, and I remember what I did back in Game 7 of the World Series. I didn't mm. come there for a haircut. <laughs> I got my jewelry. I got three of them. I just wish he would wear it. It wasn't, they didn't give him a ring. They just gave him a wrestling belt. He's like, I got my jewelry. And <laughs> he came out there with a championship belt as a ring. Oh, man. John Lackey, thanks, thanks for the memories. <laughs> the long memories. The long memories. Oh. <laughs> uh. I guess with that, I think we're going to wrap up the show. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Long show. <laughs> I remember when Jonathan Taze threw up in the box. That was me who kicked his ass. Uh, Patrick Kane needs a haircut. <laughs> I don't like that mullet. He got jewelry not as good as mine. <laughs> I can fight too. I'll be your enforcer. <laughs> Imagine uh, John Lackey is your team enforcer. He goes out on there with, into the ice with cowboy boots. <laughs> <laughs> and his skates are like spurs. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you, you need a helmet. He goes, I, I got a hat on. <laughs> cowboy hat, 10 gallons. He's got he's got like tight jeans on, but he's got like knee pads in front of him. He's at the face off dot spitting tobacco out and they're like, oh, you can't you can't spit another. And he goes <laughs> He gets called for hooking and instead of just like giving the same old like what did I do? What do you mean kind of look a hockey player gives, he just he just charges at them like he did against the umpire against the Cardinals that one time. Oh, man. John Lackey. I think we should uh, have an episode one day where we just we recreate the uh, the memoirs of John Lackey's life. And it's just a whole like telling of the story from from birth until now. And we'll just we'll make it completely ridiculous. Uh, is true fact is if there was a John Lackey autobiography, it was written with only using two index fingers and, <laughs> and heavy hitting of the keys. It's like... I have a long memory. That son of a bitch, that was a strike. Oh, he called him safe. I know that SOB was out. Ugh. <laughs> oh. John Lackey, you know, it's a guy that probably yells at his wife in public. Honey, I told you. I said, park the car over there. What did you do? You didn't listen. I remember where I told you to park the car. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please make sure you hit subscribe, however you uh, get your podcast, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Or just mashing the uh, keyboard. <laughs> just mashing the keyboard John Lackey style. <laughs> <laughs> just as long as you have a long memory and you can remember to listen to the podcast next week. Exactly. <laughs> uh. Uh, same John Lackey channel, same John Lackey jokes, same John uh, Lackey jewelry, <laughs> same John Lackey haircut. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, please share with your friends. If you want to hit us up on social media at shy fan, Pat one and at Swirsky sports on Twitter, facebook.com slash Swirsky sports, Swirsky sports.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, Bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick uh, and God and haircuts for all the hits. Oh, oh, oh. Cubs win! Cubs win! I won the Mac Cubs game. Win. Oh, I don't want her.
Or you can have her, she's a Packer fan. I don't she know what Joe Bland was doing, but <laughs> he should have like been pitching me every game. Smoking crack is we would have won every game. game. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing.